If you're a fan of Lil Peep, Lil Tracy, or Goth Boy Click, you've most likely heard of Drippin' So Pretty, who has been a large part of the emo or goth sphere in the SoundCloud scene. Currently, the subgenre he's associated with is incredibly oversaturated. However, Drip manages to stay authentic and innovate consistently. His music predominantly contains themes of depression, drug abuse, and women. Having said that, most listeners still don't know how deep his story goes. His addiction, recovery, relationships with other famous artists such as Lil Peep, how he got his way into music, and his life story in general. Davis Timothy Wilson, better known as Drippin' So Pretty, was born on June 3rd, 1994. He's a quarter Japanese and white and was raised in San Diego. As a kid, he was really into skateboarding, music, and surfing, like many other kids from California. His mom had a record player and she would play Queen. On the other hand, his dad would play funk. He would watch MTV and VH1 on TV. This would introduce his young Drip to new music such as metal, rock, and rap, specifically from viewing MTV. Lil Wayne and Ludacris were some of his early favorites, as well as others who were popping on MTV in the early 2000s, like T-Pain, and Sum 41. He got into surfing through his godfather, a friend of his father's named Paul, who gifted him his first surfboard. Drip and his surfboard would become inseparable, even almost having drowned once. One day, while surfing, the board snapped in half, started dragging him down beneath the surface due to the hollow body surfboard. While growing up, Drip would also spend a lot of time playing drums on a traditional rock style drum set. After his friend Neil couldn't bring his drum set with him when he moved, he gifted it to Drip. He taught himself how to play drums, likely inspired by his late father who was a drummer. Rest in peace. He actually played the drums in his high school band so he could avoid running the mile daily. The first time he dabbled in making music was with his friend Paul from elementary school. They made death metal with Drip taking the role of the drummer. Drip's musical taste primarily consisted of rap from middle school to high school. In middle school, he was really into the Berkeley based rap group known as The Pack. In 10th grade, he discovered the bass god himself, thank you bass god, Lil B. And in 12th grade, he got into Lex Luger, Wiz Khalifa, Cabin Fever, Waka Flocka and Gucci Mane. He started rapping with his friend Burger in 2011, but he didn't take it seriously. The first beat he ever hopped on was a Chief Keef type beat. He was actually inspired by the Chicago based rappers Chief Keef and Soldier Boy to sing on rap beats. Drip would freestyle in his friend Burger's car. Burger mostly made EDM. But after hearing Drip rap, he decided to buy a mic and started to record him. Together they made Lotus Blossom. At this time, he went by Drip Lord Splash because his Instagram was Drip Lord Splash God. He only made a couple songs under this moniker. And later, because he felt like the bass stuff from the original scene he associated with was played out, he wanted to change his name to be unique and he renamed himself to Drippin' So Pretty. Now, he says he wishes it wasn't his name because of how the word Drip means swag, which just makes him cringe. So far, I've just described his interests, hobbies, and the fun stuff going on in his early life. But Drip was actually struggling with drug abuse throughout his entire life. He started with weed in middle school, much like many other California surfer kids. However, by the time he was in 9th grade, he would do ecstasy every weekend, as well as starting to abuse Xanax to avoid anxiety. Being that Drip was only a kid at the time, to afford all these drugs he would steal from others to sell for drug money. By the time he was 15, in his sophomore year of high school, he started abusing opiates like oxys and heroin. His life wasn't tough, but he described it as being one of the best feelings in the world, and life was just better when he wasn't sober. He always hung out with older kids, and to them, this type of drug abuse was normal. He hit rock bottom at 16, when his addiction brought him to using heroin, suboxone, meth, Xanax, and other prescription medications. He was so addicted that one time his mom caught him smoking and he faked tears to pretend he was remorseful, threw the blunt away, and then proceeded to fish it out the trash to smoke again. He tried to get help, but every time he tried to get sober, his addiction ended up getting worse. His mom decided to start homeschooling him, but he started doing drugs even more once he was at home away from other kids his age, and this made the problem so much worse. A doctor he went to ended up prescribing him way more Suboxone, a drug used to reverse the side effects of short-acting opiates that he was supposed to have. Suboxone is still a narcotic drug, and he ended up getting addicted to that as well. He went back to high school in his senior year and was expelled for having a meth pipe. He described his high school years as hell. Early on, he was just a skater that got along with everyone. Later, he didn't have any friends because everyone knew he was severely addicted to drugs and would steal, lie, cheat, or just do about anything to get that next high. Eventually, he overcame his addiction and became sober, but this only lasted a couple years. Pretty soon, he was lying to his girlfriend and was back to using drugs behind her back, but he convinced himself by saying, I'll just smoke weed. A week later, he was doing dope again. Along with adopting the incredibly toxic mentality, he can't be sober and be a rapper. Trip described himself by saying, I'm the type of person, dude, that like I take things to an extreme and until like my life is completely fucked and i'm like dug myself so fucking far down that i like can barely fucking get out that's when i'm like oh maybe i should like make a change you know what i mean hmm. and that's just not like normal but like for someone like me it is luckily after everything he had gone through he had become friends with a guy named garrett who lived a block away from him garrett became drippin so pretty sponsor someone who mentors an addict with previous experience within the program and has an extended period of sobriety alcohol is anonymous or double a for short which could be considered a lifeline in the life of so many addicts Around this time, Drip had nowhere else to go, so he moved to LA at 22 with his girlfriend and her mom. 
Drippin' So Pretty has almost been completely sober since around 2017. He's been very open and transparent about his struggles with addiction, sobriety, and mental health, and he even openly mentioned one or two slip-ups on social media where he'd use ketamine along with weed. Drip is known for his emo sound today. However, when starting his rap career, he was rapping more so on beats while only singing occasionally. His first official song, Lotus Blossom, does a mix of both, rapping and dropping bars verse after verse while singing on the hook. In the past 8 years since then, he's developed his current sound, which can be divided into two eras. The first being his more basic trap influenced sound, such as an I Need a Coop, and the second, his emo trap type music, which he is best known for currently. Drippin' So Pretty has dropped 29 tapes, about half of which he utilized his older sound, where he has consistently stuck to his newer sound since 2018. His older sound is mostly him rapping on tread, plug, and bass god type beats. He'd rap more traditionally on songs like Nuck If You Buck, while also showing glimpses of his potential as a singer, occasionally on songs like Finesse Me, Lil Baby, and of course, Lotus Blossom. Drip had no aversion to singing. It just wasn't his style at the time, seeing himself more as a hype rapper. Weatherman intro is a phenomenal example of this early style. Within the lyrics, he raps about hoes, violence, and drugs like Xanax. During this period, he would collaborate frequently with Gigi Neeks, and it was also around this time Drippin' So Pretty's friendship with HL Smook began, to the best of my knowledge. If you didn't know, Smook actually started out as a producer working with Lil B, and even Drip, for whom he would end up mixing a lot of his music. Drip didn't stand out lyrically to the usual LA slash SoCal hip-hop sound, as he talked about fast cars, hitting licks, sexualizing women, and his anti-police sentiment. Undeniably, Drippin' So Pretty's career-defining and most standout track from this time as an addict was a soul-crushingly sad love ballad, Last Shot of Heroin. He definitely caught the attention of his listeners. In the song, he describes his own addiction, how he can't control himself, and the lies he tells himself and others about this being the last time he shoots up. He was rapping about his personal experience with addiction, but the song perfectly sums up every addict's life, constantly repeating, this time is my last. According to him, he had attempted to get clean at least 100 times before finally kicking his opiate addiction after some rehab. He compares opiate addiction, heroin specifically, to a toxic relationship with the girl you are deeply in love with. He has a love-hate relationship with both. They both keep him warm when he's lonely. He still feels attached regardless of all the BS that has been caused by them. Uh, just as a quick side note, um... Don't do heroin, it's like a terrible idea. Drippin' So Pretty also portrays some harsh truths in his artwork. He blames his girl for the issues in his life, because in reality he can't face the fact that he himself is the reason for his inability to stay focused, wasting his life, stuck in a seemingly never-ending loop of drug addiction. What makes the song so special is how relatable it is. No matter the addiction you're going through, every addict has the same mindset. Just one more time with her, just one more zan, just picking up one more bag, the feeling of disappointment from others around them, and in themselves. Throughout 2017, fans could see the constant progress in his relationship and journey to sobriety. In Don't Go Back, he's trying to get his life together. Even though he knows as an addict, he'll always pick up the phone, if or when his plug calls. Despite his girlfriend's warning, he's still tempted to shoot up, to escape the overwhelming weight of reality. Even saying, baby, it's just me and my dope, let this be my romance. Showing the severity of heroin addiction with Drip even having thoughts of cutting off his girlfriend and reverting to his addict lifestyle. And not my fault, he's starting to hate his addiction and feels powerless, wanting again to crawl back into his drug den safe space, away from everyone else. He mentions how his girlfriend knows about his relapses, but won't say anything because she hates arguing, showing the guilt he feels for her having to be in a committed relationship with a recovering addict. This love for his girlfriend and passion to keep her life stable and happy is another major motivator for Drip to get his act together. At this point in his music career, he was still rapping on his earlier, more trepid influenced beats on songs like Sicko. 23. Sick Ho, he's, he's totally embodying the 2010 rapper aesthetic and personality, flexing everything available from his money, his good looks, his swag, along with the increased attention he'd been receiving at the time. On 23, he's a little realer, more open about things. He's sober, focused on himself, and getting money. Forever, produced by Jaya, Cold Heart's producer persona, is dedicated to Drip's girlfriend. He apologizes for his past actions. He wants to start anew with her and doesn't want to have to go alone. He continued to do lean. He continued to lean more. Oh, I don't know why I said he continued to do lean. <laughs> he continued to. <laughs> he continued to lean more into singing about this for the next year. He switched from rapping 90% of the time and singing a bit to primarily singing whereas now the rapping took a back seat. It's also important to note that by this time, he had already collaborated with multiple members of GBC like Lil Peep, Coldheart, and Lil Tracy. He became acquainted with Coldheart through Instagram, both having a huge interest in skateboarding, and when Drip moved to Los Angeles, they linked up and just gravitated towards each other, both of them being skaters, of course. They have some really old songs from the early days, like Riding in a Maserati, but it remained collaborators to this day. It was actually through Coldheart that he met Peep and Tracy, along with the rest of Goth Book Click. Drippin' So Pretty has two songs with Peep, Tearing and Another Cup. Another Cup was Drip's biggest song on Spotify until it was taken down due to sampling and label issues. 
Peep and Drip even performed another cup together in a very early Lil Peep LA concert. His oldest song with Tracy is No Lames. It's them rapping really fast on a Max 2K10 beat. Really underrated song, by the way. On April 23rd, 2019, he released True Love, True Pain, his debut studio album. The song True Love unfortunately got taken down to the sample that was used. It even had a video on a Starry's channel. The album has many sides to it. He's rapping what you could call pure type beats in songs like Sick in the Head, singing over guitar beats, and rapping over NetArb's dark emo beat. The standout songs, in my opinion, were Sick in the Head and True Pain. This album is actually my favorite out of all 80s released so far. I might be biased because it was my introduction to music. I remember checking it out after someone posted it to the GBC subreddit and really liking it when it first came out. When asked about his evolution and why he chose to change, he said, I think at first it was like for whatever. I didn't give a you know? When I started caring about music a lot more is after I started writing about my true emotions and experiences. When I started coming out and sharing that I was a heroin addict in recovery, I think that's when I started taking music more seriously than ever. Kids were messaging me, telling me how much I've helped them and how much they can relate to. It. That's the more important part of Driven Supreme. His next album, Die For You, dropped just six months after and it's his most successful album to date, commercially at least. Drip really honed in on his style in this album. My guess is that the consistent, and at that point in time, hype slash popular sound paired with the long-awaited Tracy feature is what made the album so popular. He also began working with Des Landis, who took the role of his main producer over the next two years. They became a really unique producer and artist duo. The next two albums weren't really about his addiction though. They were mostly centered about love and depression. In 2020, he dropped Back From Hell, really similar to his High Die For You tape. Check out the song Green Dot. Also, I really like Falling Down. It's about fake friends not being for him when he was down bad, but wanting to talk when he was up. His next album, Rest In Peace, which I'm pretty sure was dedicated to his father, was the last time he dropped a project over guitar beats. Personally, I thought this was a great move from him because his old style had started to get a bit redundant. He dropped three EPs and an album since. Blood On My Jacket, Nauseous, Sorry For The Wait, and Betrayed. The themes are really similar to what he was talking about, but the delivery was completely different. When asked about his new style, he said, I've always liked nostalgic techno stuff with girls singing on it and stuff, you know? You just know music's transforming into more EDM stuff, so it's like, okay, cool. Someone making beats like that sends it to me and I'm like, okay, I can mess with this, you know? But then I like doing it with someone like Thislandis where I can add guitar on top of it and make it my own little thing. He even expressed hopes to work with NASCAR Allo and Black Cray. Okay, so that's it for this video. If you never listened to him, go check out A Thousand Roses, Green Dot, and Last Shot of Heroin. They're all really good. Um, if you like this video, feel free to leave a comment. I'll most likely respond to it if you say something interesting. Um, and I go by Rashad Fashir. See you next time.